Well, good afternoon, everyone present. It's such a delight and anticipated privilege to be here at CLAMP and on the Anderson campus. I want to thank my friend and now really of decades, Dr. Michael Didway, for inviting me to be part of this uh, series of lectures. Uh, we've been friends, I think, to Didway since uh, before the launch of Preaching Magazine in Tampa many years ago. Is that right? <clears throat> well, it's a delight to rejoin with him and to see what's happening here in the remarkable history of Clam and what you're doing together. I do bring you greetings from brothers and sisters in Christ <clears throat> at George W. Truett Theological Seminary, which is on the campus at Baylor University in Waco, uh, where I live and work, along with Chip and Joanne Gaines, uh, <laughs> who are our first citizens uh, of Waco. In this series of lectures, after considering those who've gone before, such lauded and venerated homileticians and pastor practitioners, <clears throat> I asked Dr. Didway if I might address the place of lived experience in sermons. Let's consider that uh, I were to preach on the book of Nehemiah. Two ways to start a sermon on Nehemiah. Suppose I said, in post-exilic Israel, about 444 BC, when Artaxerxes was the Persian emperor, how many people do you think stayed with me after the first three or four words? of that sermon. If post-exilic didn't get them, 444 BC probably took them right out of it. And uh, they're busy with their phones or their devices. <clears throat> what if I were to say, I stood there on a crisp fall afternoon and there were women about my age going up running their finger over names carved in the marble. One of them just stood there and wept while she did it. There were young women holding up babies who didn't even know where they were, putting their fingers on those same letters. There were people leaving things down at the bottom uh, golf clubs, old work shoes. I was standing at the Vietnam Memorial War in the nation's capital, watching how people from generations responded to looking at those more than 50,000 names. Sometimes a war is just more than a wall. It was decades before that I stood in the divided city of Berlin. Not at Checkpoint Charlie, but out in a neighborhood where that city was divided east and west by a wall with a ditch in between where people were dying trying to get out of the east into the west. I remember climbing up on a a little prominence, and I looked across that wall, and East German communist soldiers actually unshouldered their weapons when I was looking at them. Sometimes a wall is just more than a wall. There was a Jewish layperson named Nehemiah who went back home to rebuild a wall that was more than just a wall. It was the witness that the God of that city could protect the city. Now, <laughs> if we were to take a vote on beginning a sermon talking about post-exilic Israel, Artaxerxes in 444 BC, or telling a story about some walls, my experience would suggest I'm more likely in that critical first two minutes of a sermon to engage people to listen using the lived experience of looking at some 
wolves. That's an illustration. It's beginning a sermon with an illustration from the world of nowness rather than thinness. I have an invented character I talk about in my classes. I've given him the name Joe Sixpack. That doesn't have to do with going to the gym. <laughs> he just got to church. He working two, maybe two and a half or three jobs. He hasn't read a book ever or it's been years. Like most congregants, his reading comprehension level is 10th grade. I've got about two minutes to get Joe's attention at the beginning of a sermon. Tom Long, the classicist, the Presbyterian, says, I already have it because I'm ordained, but I can lose it. Fred Craddock says, I don't have it, but I need to get it. Either way, after two minutes, Joe's out of there <laughs> if I don't engage him. This is just one example of the importance of lived experience in sermons. Now let me say this caveat. I'm going to be using the word lived experience most of the time for what we used to call illustrations. And there's a reason, if I could, a reason on the downside. So many illustrations have either been incredible, inappropriate, or just flat unbelievable that the word sermon illustration itself has been <laughs> tainted. You hear this with the sometimes phrase used by lay persons, oh, that's just a preacher story, which means it's highly unlikely that ever happened. So I've come to use the word lived experience, but lived experience encompasses everything that used to be an illustration. Kind of reminds me of calling that entertainer that used to be named Prince. I call it lived experience. And that is anything in nature or human experience, which is just about anything. <laughs> now, before we get down to the nitty gritty of the practical use of stories, let me back up a little bit and talk about a few theoretical things. Why should you do it at all? Because there are still those who maintain that if you're a biblical preacher, it needs to be biblical. Well, theologically, there was a battle between the, on the continent between Karl Barth and Emil Brunner. Karl Barth insisted that there is no analogy for our experience with God. It is so utterly different that nothing in human experience provides an adequate analogy. Someone said Bart had such a view of scripture that his idea of preaching, if it would work, would just be to plug in an electric Bible on the Lord's supper table and just let it vibrate. On the other hand, Emil Brunner, continental theologian, says there is a point of contact. There is an analogy between human life and experience and what God does. Now it's interesting, when Bart actually preached, not in his theory, but in his practice, he used incredibly good sermon illustrations because he knew he couldn't preach unless he kept people's attention. But to speak in those kind of exalted continental terms, I'm way more with Bruner than I am with Bart. There is a point of contact. I think of it as the lower, lesser, lighter, and the higher, holier, heavier. The text is the higher, the holier, and the heavier. The given, the word of God. But whatever the higher, holier, heavier may be, whether it's an image, God is our rock, God is our shield, God is light, or whether it's a concept, propitiation, justification, any concept, at that higher, holier, heavier level, you will find a point of contact with something at the lower, lesser, lighter level. And it usually works that way. Now, sometimes, however, 
in thinking about sermons, you may encounter such a human story or a natural phenomenon at the lower, lesser, lighter level that it will lead you to a text at the higher, holier, heavier level. More of that later. F.W. Borum, a British man who went to New Zealand and Australia, was one of the great sermon illustrators of the late 19th and 20th century. Borum would begin with the lower, lesser, lighter, something in nature or history, and find something in the higher, holier, heavier to attach it to, and his sermons were always acutely observed, keenly noted observations from life or nature, <laughs> and he found a text to go with them. Now you can imagine there are some inherent dangers in that, but it can work either way if you believe that God revealed himself in the world of life or nature, not equal to scripture. There's a point of contact between the higher, holier, heavier, the lower, lesser, lighter. Now, the classical grammarians call that the tertium. It was the place of contact between human life experience and holy word of God. More of that later. Now, this has to do with the whole world of metaphor. Metaphor is to say this is that. Someone has said that metaphor is really the nature of human existence. This is that. It's so prominent in scripture that you can't read scripture without finding it. God is our rock. God is our shield. God is our refuge or in the ego and me statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am. That's all metaphor. Now, every metaphor has in it a yes and a no. And every lived experience in a sermon has in it a yes and a no. It is like this in this way, but it's not like this in that way. If I say God is a rock, that doesn't mean he's sedimentary rather than Ignatius. <laughs> That's the no. It means he's solid, stable, unmovable. If I say God is light, that doesn't mean he's made up of waves or particles, angstroms and lumens. It means the very nature of God is to reveal himself rather than to conceal himself like light. So when we're talking about lived experience in sermons, we're talking about finding that exact place where the lower, lesser, lighter is like the higher, holier, and heavier. There's also the background of the way we use stories and some rhetorical insights. Uh, in his highly conceptual book, The Four Codes of Preaching, <laughs> John McClure of Vanderbilt Divinity School says, when we're preaching, four things are going on like four tracks if you're recording a garage band. <laughs> One track is how you use scripture. The second track is how you're using rhetoric. The third track is how God looks when people listen to you. He calls that the theosymbolic track. How does God come across in this sermon? But the fourth one is what he calls the cultural code. And that is how do you use stories from life? Now, I want to camp out there just a moment. <laughs> Putting aside the way you use scripture, whether it is a literal use, a dynamic equivalent, putting aside whether your preaching rhetorically is denotative and linear and deductive, or whether it's connotative and indirect, theosymbolic, whether God always wins, or whether he's a stern judge, a policeman, a cosmic kind of Matt Dillon, or a gracious Santa Claus, how does God look? There's a fourth thing you do in sermons, and that is how you use the world of human experience around you. Now, if I could use my language for that, some people only use illustrative materials in sermons in a very literal way that identifies one on one with the text. Now, if I could reach back in my earlier experience, give you a couple examples of this. First Corinthians 
makes it clear to Corinth that men should not have what? Long hair. Well, the identity illustration came out, say, in the hippie movement of the 60s. Look right here. It says clearly it's a shame for men to have long hair, a one-to-one -one identity. So the story only got into the sermon if it was identified with the text. <laughs> or... Uh, <laughs> Some of you all remember this, the burning of the Beatles records on the church parking lot because of a remark John Lennon said, well, this was used in sermons against idolatry. And we're going to burn that vinyl because he claimed that he was as well known as Jesus. That, that is the identity illustration, one-to-one -one correspondence with the text. That's a very limited, narrow, cramped, truncated way to use illustrative material. The way we should use it, I believe, is by analogy, that one thing like this lower, lesser, lighter touches one thing about the higher, holier, and heavier in the text. If I'm preaching from Psalm 1, for example, <laughs> that great opening word of the Psalter, in which the righteous man is like a tree planted by rivers of water. Well, in that arid uh, holy land, the only place you find trees growing naturally is in the Jordan Rift because they're close to the water and their roots have resources from the Jordan. <laughs> now, I think through that is finding a story. And I began to look for a story, a story of roots, a story of tree with deep roots. And I find that in South Africa, there is a tree with the deepest known roots anywhere in the earth. Those roots are 400 feet deep. It's really a little shrub in desert-like land, but 400 feet under it are subterranean pools of water. And the roots of that tree penetrate the soil and the rock down 400 feet into hidden subterranean resources of water. And regardless of what's going on the surface, that tree has hidden resources. Now, I'm not saying God is like everything about that tree. God is about everything like roots or rhizomes. I'm saying at one point, there is an analogy. And that analogy is endless hidden resources for the righteous person of God. Now, I, here is uh, something I want to emphasize a great deal about sermon illustrations. Not everything about any story equals everything in your text. That's where sermon stories derail. And sometimes that, that point of contact is so ambiguous that it's hard to tell exactly what about this is like anything in the Bible. Uh, I heard a sermon a while back from Acts 9, uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And the sermon was introduced by recounting the cartoon character, Rotor Runner and Wiley Coyote. And this uh, curious introduction says, uh, God is not like the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. You see, uh, Wiley Coyote never gets the Roadrunner, but God got Saul. I pondered that for a while. <laughs> Altogether, aside from the fact they were comparing one of the great moments in human history to some fictitious cartoon characters, I was trying to decide what were the points of contact between the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and Wiley Coyote. Maybe you can help me after this to see that more clearly. That's a vague point of contact. When sermon illustrations go awry, it's typically because that point of contact between lower, lesser, lighter, higher, holier, heavier is vague. It's ambiguous. 
It's not denotative enough. And the congregation is left scratching its head. What is it about this that touches that in the sacred word of God? Sometimes just a sentence or two can help the congregation see that. Otherwise, they're left being puzzled. And I say that to say, in the analogy approach, be sure that analogy is clear. Now, there's another approach to illustrating, which I would call the cultural disconnect. And that is the only illustration that gets into the sermon comes out of Christian life and Christian history. And if anything else gets into the sermon, it's in the negative. That is, Jim Elliott, the great missionary hero, may get into my sermon as an example of uh, Christian sacrifice. Uh, our Corey Ten Boom, same thing. But no secular character would ever get into my sermon. It's a closed off sectarian world in which nothing in literature, art, statuary, or human experience that isn't explicitly Christian gets into the sermon. It is a sectarian view of sermon illustrating that the only thing that gets into the sermon are stories of great Christians. This ignores the fact that in art, literature, biography, music, and human experience, 50% of the stories you can tell in sermons are antitype. That is their opposite of the Christian virtue that you're stressing. If you're talking about generosity, half the stories are about people who are covetous. If you're talking about purity of life, stories about impurity. It's endless, and I find that preachers often don't use half the stories they could use because those stories are counterpoint to the virtue they're emphasizing. Now, this raises another question. Why not just use... Bible only. That is, illustrate scripture with scripture. Intertextuality. If I'm looking at the Ten Commandments, the Tenth Commandment shall not covet, well, why not just tell the story of Ahab and Naboth's vineyard? I addressed this a moment in the cohort this morning. That would work if we lived in a biblically literate world. How many people sitting out there in 2019 do you think when you say the word Naboth, it just calls somebody to mind immediately? Now, if you were preaching in Spurgeon or McLaren's day, you could bet in Victorian England that a whole lot of people knew what you were talking about. In today's world, if you mention Naboth, what do you have to do? You have to take five minutes to explain who Naboth was. That is, you take a vacation from your text and when you take a vacation from the text, there's a possibility that your ticket back may be canceled. When you move out of the sermon and take people over here to explain another Bible story, in the words of David Buttrick, you have split the move. You've divided their consciousness, and it's hard to get them back in the text you were talking about. There are many reasons why, but that's one reason why biblical stories seldom work in the same way that illustrative material would help unless the people know the story. Now, all preaching is venue specific. If you're in a church where you make a, a, a rare biblical allusion to another character and everybody's got it, well, bless you. Let the Lord bless you. You can use that. But that's an unusual situation now. Now, that's a little bit of theoretical background. I don't want to stay there too long. I'd like to get down to some reasons other reasons why we need to live, use lived experience. The first reason is what I call recovery. And that is for you to recover the attention of the congregation after a rhetorical seam or unit or packet of biblical exposition. Say you're going word by word in a text. This light momentary tribulation is working out an eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Pauline, epistolary, every word fraught with theological significance. You're explaining 
the background of this in 2 Corinthians. You're explaining that that word light is from a Greek word that means light as a feather. That momentary was a word used of the blinking of an eye. That thalipsis, tribulation, means so and so. How long do you think the typical congregate can stay with that now? <laughs> 30 years ago, Patrick said he thought four or five minutes. More recently, Leonard Sweet, uh, the Methodist Mathery cultural interpreter, told me maybe two minutes. And then they're checking out because we preach in a world of distraction. Now, Facebook has determined that the, the, the Facebook pages that get the most attention are those that have no more than 70 words. That is, you're going to flip through it if it looks like they wrote a book. The Archbishop of Canterbury in 2015 tweeted his Easter sermon. The head of worldwide <laughs> Anglicanism tweet, in that kind of world, if you dwell overly long on expository explanation, whether you like it or not, people check out. Their eyes look like the wheels in slot machines. They just go back up in their head and they're distracted. One reason to use lived experience for me is to recover people's attention so that I can bring them back to the text. I do want text-driven sermons. But a lot of people can't stay in that car more than two or three minutes without being brought back with story. Something from nowness that sheds light on thenness. So how do you spell relief when it comes to <laughs> biblical exposition? You spell it lived experience. I know. I know there are exceptions. I venerate the late Reverend Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, medical doctor, preacher doctor. He took 14 years to preach through the book of Romans. Erdman's has printed it, but if you were sitting there on Friday nights with the 2,000 people in Westminster Chapel, it took Lloyd-Jones 14 years to go through Romans. There were people who came, were converted, were ordained to the ministry, commissioned to go off on a mission, came back, and he was still in Romans. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible exegetical sermons, sometimes with just two or three words. You can read them or you can listen to them on the Lloyd-Jones legacy site prepared by his, by his grandson, Christopher Catherwood. But out of 8 million plus people in the greater London area, his style of preaching attracted 2,000 to come and listen to those word-by-word -word expositions of Romans. Today, they're more like exegetical resources for preachers than they are sermons that the average Joe sitting in the congregation could listen to or follow. Pure exposition. There are some places, but they're fewer and fewer, where you can keep people's attention and they won't check out. I quoted it this morning, and the guys forgive me for saying it again, Chuck Swindoll's statement that the ultimate sin of a communicator is not to communicate. If I take 30 minutes in the pulpit, declining nouns, parsing verbs, giving etymology and rare tidbits of the folkways and mores of first century Judaism, and I'm throwing frisbees over the head of the congregation, they may say, whoa, hmm. Preacher must have been up there to clamp to study. <laughs> we don't understand a thing. He's talking about what have I done unless somebody catches the frisbee? That is, it lands in somebody's lap because I actually communicated. I have to communicate with the congregation that is there, not the congregation I wish was there. And in order to do that, it requires some facility with lived experiences. Now, a second reason, other than recovery, is to make clear otherwise abstract biblical concepts. Let's go back to my old text, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. This light, momentary tribulation. 
is fully working out an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now let's say I've labored to talk about those words, light, momentary, tribulation, that thalipsis, that grinding pressure, and the fact that the verb there means fully and completely work out. And I talk about weight of glory, really meaning glory, glory, because the word glory means heavy. And I've done that for a while. I've pushed it at about two or three minutes of that. But I still haven't made clear what Paul is saying. And that is an experience of tribulation and pressure now is in and of itself fully working out glory in the world to come. That's a difficult abstraction. How is it that this rejection, this misunderstanding, this surgical operation, or for Paul's sake, getting beaten with rods, whipped with whips, shipwrecked three times, how is that working out? An eternal way to work. It begs for a lived experience. So, in order to make that abstract Pauline epistolary truth clear, I might say, see this piano over here. It's a grand piano. It has 230 strings. If it's a 